Thanks to the organizer for the kind invitation. Uh, Copasi uh, is one of uh, the main tools uh, used in the pool, uh, and, and that has been so for many, many years. Uh, you heard about biomodels yesterday, I believe, and so Copasi is the tool we use uh, for curating most of the models uh, in biomodels database. But today I'm not going to talk about biomodels at all. Uh, I still will present some work uh, done with the help of, uh, of Copasi. So what I'm going to do is actually to present um, a body of work that has been uh, done over almost 10 years now in, uh, in my group dealing with uh, the allosteric calcium sensors in the uh, dendritic spine, uh, which is the small part of a neuron that received the, the excitatory inputs. So, at the level of, of a neuron, I'm sure you all know that, but uh, you have uh, electrical activity that comes, uh, that is projected through an axon to a terminal that triggers the release of neurotransmitter. This neurotransmitter diffuses, activates uh, uh, some receptors, um, and, and then the receptors often are in channel trigger the polarization of the post scientific neuron, and the signal is propagated. So if you look at the, the voltage of this percent membrane, you can see that you have a suddenly a depolarization and a signal uh, propagating, right, in a matter of milliseconds. If you look at this slope here, the onset slope, it's a constant for each synapse. It depends on what we call the weight of the synapse, okay? Um, so if, if you come and you record it in five minutes, you will get the same slope, no matter what is the intensity of the percent uh, sign? But in some uh, experimental setup, you can actually modify this constant. So, for instance, if you come with a tetanic uh, presynaptic pulse, very, very, very quick presynaptic pulse, you will suddenly have a digital increase of the, the weight of the synapse, right? And then, if you come after a few minutes, you record the synapse, you will still find this uh, uh, enhanced way. That's called long-term uh, uh, potentiation. And this is mostly due to increase of the number of receptors in the post uh, density, but also change of their properties, uh, aggregation of receptor, phosphorylation that change the conductance, and so on and so forth. If you come with some other experimental setup, for instance, if you decrease the natural firing rate of the presynaptic neurons, you uh, actually can decrease this constant and that's called long-term de uh, long depression. So we say long-term because it lasts for, for days or, or, or week. Although all that is actually part of short-term plasticity, which doesn't make things easier. Um, so over the last 30 years or so, uh, a theory has been developed um, to uh, explain at least part of those uh, personality plasticity that revolves around calcium. So calcium gets through the, uh, the glutamate receptors, the, the receptor to the neurotransmitter, voltage jetting uh, ion channel in the plasma membrane, and internal uh, cell stores. And all this calcium will then uh, activate calmodulin, and calmodulin will either activate phosphatase leading to depression or kinases leading to potentiation. So calmodulin is really the, the big uh, decider of the direction of the, of the plasticity. So here are my actors today. Calcium, that can bind calmodulin, and calcium can also uh, bind the regulatory subunit of calcinery, protein phosphate S2B. So protein phosphate S2B is one of the targets of calmodulin. Calmcan S2 is another target. And uh, I will also talk about uh, a third um, target called neurogranin for which we don't have a, a 3D structure, actually, uh, because it's a, it's a dissolved protein uh, in its natural state. So yeah, since its discovery in uh, 1977, I think, calmodulin traditionally has been modeled as such by, by, by the people using it in signaling pathways. It, binds, it can bind four calcium ions, right, calmodulin. It has four different uh, what we call EF ends. Uh, and so people model it by binding one calcium, second calcium, third calcium, fourth calcium. And once it has bond for calcium, it can activate its targets. 
uh, this is all well, but that doesn't work for me. Because if you do that, there is no way Calmodulin can activate differentially some of its targets and not all of its targets, right? It will activate all of its targets. So if you do a simulation in Copasi, that's my only Copasi screenshot. <laughs> uh, but, but the rest of the curve are also <laughs> done in Copasi. <coughs> So if you simulate that uh, and you increase, so that's a, just a parameter scan, right? And you increase the initial concentration of calcium, you see that you activate calcineurin in blue and tempcanase in red, right? exactly the same, uh, with the same dynamic, it's a normalized uh, activation with the same KD. And we knew that. We knew that because we knew that calcium can activate calcineurin with less than four calcium uh, ion bond experimentally. And uh, it can also bind calcanes 2 with only 2 calcium. And we also know, crucially, that calcodulin affinity for calcium increases when it's bound to calcanes 2 and another target. So that's, that's a hallmark of what we call allosteric uh, behavior. If you have a, 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 an induced fit model or a model where you bind ligand and then you activate things, you will never, never change the affinity based on the, on the antenna. Right. So what we need to do is we need to, to, to use another framework, the allosteric framework developed uh, in the 60s. So sorry for the biochemist in the room. I'm going to go back in the basics. You can uh, shut eyes for a while and recover from yesterday. Um, so the idea of, of, of the model is that a protein is in thermal equilibrium between different states. And that is completely independent of any ligand, right? It's naturally, it's in equilibrium. <coughs> and this equilibrium is uh, characterized by the difference of free energy between the different states, right? And we call this uh, L, the allosteric constant. Uh, and <coughs> so that's the ratio of the different states in the absence of ligand. If L is really, really big, that means the equilibrium is strongly biased toward these states the basal states or inactive states or closed state, whatever you want to call it. Okay? In other we call that the T state. And uh, the, the other state is called the OR state. For tense and relax, that doesn't mean anything, it's just historical. So, what does a ligand do? A ligand will bind to the two states, and because they have different structure, the affinity will be different, right? And because the affinity is, is different, uh, the, the ligand will stabilize one of the two states. So thanks to physics, we know that from, to go from this point to this one, we can go either that way or that way. So if you know the allosteric constant and the affinity for the two states, you can actually compute the uh, uh, equilibrium constant here, right? It's, it's very easy. So we have this constant C, which is a ratio of the affinity in the two states. If C is very, very small, that means the ligand has a very strong effect. If C is 1, the ligand has no effect on the conformational transition. That happens sometimes. So this is the free energy diagram that you get at the end. So initially, I have my two states with this one stabilized, and then I get my two other states with the ligand bond, and the, the or state is stabilized. So that's one thing. The second thing, and the most controversial, is that in a protein with several binding sites, all the binding sites are in the same state at the time uh, scale of the measurement. So, of course, at the femtosecond, we know it's not true, but as far as biochemistry is concerned, they're in the same state. <coughs> so if you put, uh, so, so just, just uh, uh, to, to precise, for calmodulin, we have actually experimental evidence for many of those states. So it's been crystallized in the absence of calcium, and you have this structure where you have the four EF and uh, in, the, in the closed state with uh, alpha helix that are mostly uh, parallel to each other. It's been crystallized in the presence of calcium, high concentration of calcium, and this time you have the four EF and that have a different conformation with the, the uh, uh, alpha helixes that are uh, perpendicular, right? It's a very distinct state. We don't have the other state with calcium. However, we have the state that binds zinc. And because zinc is smaller than calcium, it can fit the resting state, the closed state. So when uh, people <coughs> crystallize the zinc bond calmodulin, uh, they found out that uh, it fitted with the, what they call apocalmodulin, but that's 
really the R, the, the T state, the closed state. So we have this one. The only one we don't have is this one. The problem is that in this state, the affinity for calcium is so high that calcium is almost a resident uh, um, metal there. Um, right. So now we have everything. We can build the model. So the model uh, has can modeling in uh, two states, the T state and OR state, or closed and open, and it can bind or not can modeling, right? So what you have is initially with on modeling, the T state is strongly favored, then one calmodulin can bind, two calmodulin, three calmodulin, four, oh sorry, three calcium. And then as, as the calcium binds to calmodulin, progressively the equilibrium is shifted from the T state to the O state. Okay? That's more complicated than that. So that was, you know, 2008. Most of the structure of calmodulin have the four EF hands in the same state. But this is not always the case. So here you have three-dimensional structure of calmodulin bound to the myosin, myosin light shed kinase with four calcium bound. And you see that all the EF hands are uh, in the OR state. Bound to neurobrani. And you see that all the EF hands are in the uh, T state. And we'll, we'll come back uh, to that in, in a minute. But actually, you have some weird structure, such as uh, this, this uh, sodium channel, uh, where sodium channel, this sodium channel is actually two binding sites for cal cal calmodulin. One that binds calmodulin in the OR state, the other in the T state. And we have a structure where one lobe of calmodulin is in the OR state with calcium bond and one lobe in the T state. So we need something more complicated. We need an hemiconcerted model of calmodulin. Amy concerted because one lobe will be concerted with two EF hands that are always in the same state, but the two lobes can switch kind of independently one to the other. They influence each other, but uh, they are not completely concerted. So this is what we have. It, it looks complicated, but it's not really, right? The only difference is now you have the, the lobes that uh, switch independently, and, uh, and the, the calmodin can bind the target of those states and you have more constants that are basically the same constant I described before, L and, and, and C, except now they, they, they are independent for the bio slope and, and for the target. So if you put all that together, you have to add calcium as well. So this is only one lobe, right? Uh, that can bind target or calcium. So if you, put, you can put that together, and now you need to parameterize the model. We talked about, uh, a lot about identifiability uh, yesterday, and I think we will uh, keep talking about that today. The good thing with calmodulin is that biochemists made uh, a, a huge number of experiments, and were very thorough, and it's incredibly reproducible. I, I rarely found that anywhere else. So here you have, for instance, three different uh, experiments from, the, from 1980 to 1997, as you can see. It's very reproducible. So that the binding of calcium on calmodulin, the complete calmodulin, but people also studied the two lobes separately, right? So we have all that, and we can use that to parameterize the model and to check. Uh, so use some of the data to parameterize the model, some of the data to validate the model. And, uh, and check that it fits. So this is the fit of the two independent lobe in blue and red, and in green, uh, the fit with the, the, the complete uh, calmodulin. So once we have that, we can look at the, at the parameters um, uh, we obtain. What we obtain is a, a model with a L, a constant of 20,000. What does it mean? It means that in the complete absence of calcium, <coughs> For 20,000 molecules of calmodulin, you will have one molecule of calmodulin that is able to bind the target and activate them, even without calcium. Yeah? And C is uh, 4, 10 minus 3, which means that the affinity for the OR state is 250 times higher than for the T state. And we got four different affinities for the EF hands, too high, too low. That's uh, what, what we expect. And then you can look at um, what is the effect of the calcium, right? So that's the proportion of active calmodulin. If you have 0, 1, 2, 4 uh, uh, calcium bond, as I said, 1 over 20,000 are active in the absence of calcium. With 4 calcium bond, you have actually one 
uh, in 10,000 that is still uh, in the in the T state. So you never reach 100% of activation in an allosteric uh, context. Right? But interestingly, if you have two calcium bonds, you have almost equal probability to be in the R and T state. So that explains what I said at the beginning, right? If you have less than full saturation, you can still activate the, the, the target. So one crucial thing about calmodulin, I mentioned it before, is that when calmodulin binds its target, its affinity for calcium increases. That's a cru crucial hallmark of, of, of allosteric model, right? So that's calmodulin with on target, and that's, calmodulin, that's calcium binding to calmodulin, and with different targets. So what does the model do? Uh, it, it actually reproduces uh, that. So here I have data co uh, corresponding to uh, two different peptides, one that stabilizes the both lobe and one that stabilizes only uh, uh, the C lobe, the, the, the C terminal lobe. And uh, so as you can see, only half of the molecule is stabilized in the high affinity state. And that's very important, very, very important. Because actually, if you look at the calmodulin in the total absence of target, right, it, it's half uh, active at 10 minus 5 micromolar of calcium. If you look in the neuron, the neuron never reaches this concentration of calcium. So you will never activate calmodulin if that was not for the effect of target that actually stabilized the all state. And we will find that later in, in, in the talk. So that's the physiological range of one calcium spike. And here now the situation is very different, uh, right? The green curve is out of this range, but the blue curve is, is completely within this, this, uh, this range. So now we put everything together, calcium, calmodulin, calcinerin, calmcanase 2, and we look at the, the amount of uh, active calcinerin and active calmcanase 2. And now, because calcinerin has a much, I forgot to say that, calcinerin has a much higher affinity for calmodulin than calmcanase 2, it wins, right? So at lower concentration of calcium, calcinerin is activated. With higher concentration of calcium, calmcanase 2 is activated. Again, half saturation uh, of calmodulin gives significant activation of calcinerin, not of calmcanase 2 because of the low affinity. And now we have those two ranges. So because calmcanase 2 is way more concentrated than calcinerin, I think its concentration is 70 times higher than calcinerin. Initially, calcinerin wins because its affinity is higher, but eventually, calcinase 2 wins because you have more of it. Okay? So we have our, our, our two domains, and now calmodulin can decide if it activates phosphatase, therefore leading to synaptic depression, or kinase leading to synaptic potentiation. What Bug does was this part. Even with a super low concentration of calcium, you always have calcinerin active, right? And actually, this is this specific parametrization, but depending on the, the <coughs> way we uh, parametrize the model, sometimes you have crazy things, like 90% of the calcinerin that is active. And what happens is that calcinerin having a large affinity, uh, high affinity, sorry, not large, <laughs> high affinity uh, for, for calcinerin, it will stabilize calcinerin in the ore state, which is the high affinity state for the calcium. So we need something to reset the system, right? It, it cannot work that way. So what we think happens is that a third partner comes into play, and this partner is called neurobranin. So neurobranin, this is a peptide in, in, in pink of neurobranin bound to calmodulin, and as you can see, calmodulin is bound in the uh, T state, the closed state, right? So that's different from calcinerin and calcanase 2. That's the other state. And if you look at what happens to the affinity of calcium, the affinity of calcium actually decreases. The affinity of calmodulin, uh, 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 of calcium, uh, calmodulin for calcium decreases when you, you bind your granin. And the, the kind is when, when you put your granin, you, uh, you actually increase the dissociation of, of calcium from uh, calmodulin. So all that is very consistent with the fact that Neurogranin binds the T states, the state with a low affinity for, for, for calcium. So you need to put that in the model. And uh, when, so, so this is due to um, a, a <coughs> binding site called an IQ domain. This is also the binding site that was on the uh, sodium channel I mentioned before that has two binding sites. So when you have an IQ domain, you bind the T state. Uh, and here I showed data obtained by uh, either a peptide 
mimicking the, the cam canister <coughs> or calcium in a binding site or a peptide uh, uh, that is from an IQ domain. And, and you can mimic either the increase of affinity for calcium or the decrease of affinity for calcium. And uh, you can also uh, then simulate the, the, so those two curves show the uh, uh, affinity of uh, um, calcium for, uh, for calcium in the uh, absence or presence of neurogranin, and that's the kinetics. We have a bit of a problem to parameterize this <coughs> uh, part of the curve. So the initial dissociation of calcium is super fast when you add neurogranin. But I think that the problem was the experiment where the initial measurement we are not precise enough. So uh, we have new data that I obtained uh, last week that hopefully we will solve that. So when we started this part of the project, my idea was that neuroguiding will shape the, the calcium uh, 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 signal, the response to calcium, right? Uh, because it will um, basically modulate the, the state of calmodulin, therefore its affinity for calcium. Um, and in the literature, you had a few uh, hints that it was the case, but we can't simulate that. Actually, no matter what we do, it really doesn't change the, the, the calcium spike. And the reason being that the, the free calcium is actually very tiny compared to the amount of calcium that is bound to, to buffers. What happened is the distribution of calmodulin between the different targets. Okay. So uh, uh, with neuroganin, of course, neuroganin suck up a lot of, of uh, calmodulin that therefore is not available to uh, activate calcineurin and calcaneus 2. And you will see that it's, it's pretty important. So that's the model we have, uh, where you have calmodulin in two states, or high affinity for calcium, T, low affinity for calcium. When it's in the high affinity for calcium, the whole state, it can bind to calcineurin, leading to depression, or CAMCANS2, leading to a potentiation of the synapse. And then you have binding to your brain that sequesters calmodulin in the T state, uh, stabilizing it, the, so the state with low affinity for calcium. Okay? So that's the first, the end of the first part of the talk. Um, so we have an EMI mo concerted model of calmodulin, two states only for, for the F hands. Uh, binding calcium with different affinities, so we don't need a state, different structural state for 0, 1, 2 calcium bound. Um, the apparent, of affinity, uh, apparent affinity for calcium increases when bound to target, very important. Um, Calmodulin is able to bind with, to targets with less than 4 calcium bound. Calcineurin can bind calmodin at low calcium concentration, but both calcineurin and CAMCANS2 bind calcium at high concentration. And neurogranin stabilizes calmodulin in the D state, the low affinity uh, calcium state, uh, and that resets the system. So it's a calmodulin reservoir. Yeah? But all that was done at equilibrium, right? All I presented today was thermodynamic modeling. And in the synapse, this is irrelevant. So a uh, postsynaptic potential triggered by the other receptor lasts for five milliseconds. The calcium spike, 50 milliseconds. To half saturate calmodulin, you need five milliseconds. The relaxation between the two R and T states of calmodulin, it's one millisecond, if our model is right. Uh, and even the phosphorylation of CAMCANS2, uh, which is normally phosphorylation is, is slower, it's slow, but you know, it's still on the order of 100 of milliseconds. So forget equilibrium. We need a more complex model. We need to go into kinetics. So of course, if we uh, are to, uh, to do a kinetic model, we need to complexify all that. So you need calcium input. That's uh, calcium channels. You need a pump. So neurons are continuously pumping calcium out, continuously. They maintain a very, very, very low calcium concentration so that they are uh, easily uh, activated. So we need buffers. The buffers are standard in the field. Everyone uses the same kind of buffer that were measured in the 80s. Uh, and we have calcineurin, cam, uh, calmodulin. And then we can create spikes. So that's, I don't know if you see this curve, because I squished it to uh, it at the same scale. But we have very accurate measurement of calcium spikes. And so we can reproduce those spikes. And then you can come with multiple stimulation at different frequency. 
Uh, in red, you have very low frequency, so you reset the system com completely. In blue, a bit a higher frequency, and as you can see, the, cal the calvodulin doesn't go back to, to zero. And then if you have really high frequency, you increase the, the, the basal activation. Um, we need to model CAMCAN S2, and, and, and there lies the difficulty. So CAMCAN S2, remember this is a protein that will uh, be responsible of the potentiation of the synapse. So CAMCAN S2 uh, is a complex molecule, right? And uh, in particular, it has an autoliberatory domain here, that is the domain that binds calmodulin. When calmodulin binds it, it opens and stay active. Uh, and here you have a phosphorylation site, and if you phosphorylate this site, the trillion to 86, the autoinhibitory domain stays open all the time, so you don't need calmodulin anymore, right? Uh, and you have another phosphorylation site. When it's phosphorylated, calmodulin cannot bind. Okay. Okay, so that's fine. The problem is that calmodulin is actually a dodecamer, 12 subunits. And while the phosphorylation in the uh, trillion 306 is a, a is a cis phosphorylation, it's calmodulin, each calmodulin monomer uh, phosphorylating itself. <coughs> the phosphorylation of uh, trionine 286 is a trans phosphorylation. So one subunit will phosphorylate the other one, the adjacent one. And all the biochemical experiments we have are being measured on monomers. So basically, uh, this, this part where we chopped off the association domain and so, so the problem is that when you want to model that, you want, you, you have, it's very hard. You cannot use directly the catalytic activity of the monomer to represent the catalytic activity of the dodecamer. So Lou, Lou Lee, uh, a postdoc in my group, uh, at that time a PhD student, came with this really clever scheme that I'm reusing in a different context now. So first, you compute the distribution of uh, the probability of having a neighbor which is active if you are active. Okay, so if I have only one monomer active per hexamer, so it's actually, a, I said it's a dodecamer, but it's two rings of hexamer, two rings of zinc Um So of course I have no neighbor, and then if we have two uh, subunits. Sometimes they're uh, uh, two subunits active, sometimes they're neighbors, sometimes they're not, and so on and so forth. And of course, if all the subunits are active, you, the point is one. Okay, that's one thing, and then. You simulate how many active monomers you have for a given concentration of calcium. So she did that. She simulated it uh, with uh, increasing calcium concentration progressively, uh, and then you put that together, and you can estimate the uh, amount of uh, uh, active and uh, the probability to be phosphorylated for, for a given monomer. Then you fit that to a polynomial. It's actually a very, very complex polynomial. I think the 17th order. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, this is not necessary, but you know, since we can. And you can do that in Copen. Uh, then, then you can compute this uh, catalytic activity for, for a given concentration of calcium. OK, now I can put all the model together. And I uh, didn't tell you about the feedback loop that is very important. So. Uh, Calcium binds to calmodulin in two states, T and R. Calmodulin can bind to calcan S2. Calmodulin can bind to calcinerin. <coughs> calcinerin actually also binds calcium directly. So first you bind calcium that we re remove a regulatory subunit, then you bind calmodulin that activates calcinerin. Okay. But calcinerin, PP2B, will uh, inhibit the protein phosphatase inhibitor that itself inhibits uh, protein phosphatase 1. And protein phosphatase 1 is the phosphatase that removes the phosphorylation on CAMCAN S2. You know the phosphorylation that keeps it active? So you have a negative feedback loop here that you, you need to include. Parametrization, 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 yeah? And validation, you need to validate everything. So after eight years now, we have huge amount of, of validation of the model. So CAMCAN S2 kinetics validated, the calmodulin kinetics, protein phosphatase, uh, always harder to, uh, to, to validate because it's a very complicated uh, molecule and it has different activity depending on the regulatory subunit subscription. So on that, uh, yeah, we're, we're not, not bad. And then you look at what happens in the spine. So what will we, 
we will do is uh, stimulate the spine with a certain amount of calcium, always the same amount of calcium, okay? So if we increase the frequency, we decrease the duration. And you look at what's happening for calmodulin. So here, I don't have any target. I just have calmodulin and calcium. Low frequency, as you can see, it's reset after each spike. I don't know if you can see the, the small spike. If you increase the frequency, that's the beginning of the signal, you will start stabilizing significantly the uh, uh, whole state of calmodulin, right? And as you can see, of course, the duration of the stabilization decreases because the calcium signal decreases. Now we put the targets of calmodulin. And what happens completely different. So initially, that's the same thing, right? So you increase the frequency, you will increase the stabilization of calmodulin, and you decrease the duration because you decrease the duration of the signal. And then suddenly, this goes the other way around. So I keep decreasing the calcium signal duration, right? But the activation of calmodulin will start to, to become longer and longer and longer. So what's going on here? It turns out that the binding to the target stabilizes the OR state, the high affinity state for calcium. And so calmodulin stays active and binds calcium even when you stop the signal. So the free calcium decreases, but the calcium bond to calmodulin bond to the target is still there. Uh, and, and interestingly, the frequency at, at which that happens corresponds to the frequency we use to trigger long-term uh, depression and long-term potentiation. So that's quite cool. But calmodulin is just the beginning of the story. What really we want to see is the effect uh, of calmodulin on the, the, the phosphatase and the kinase. So here I have the effect of two different stimulation, a long stimulation uh, at low frequency or uh, short simulation at high frequency. So you have very different uh, uh, behavior. If in the case of the lo long uh, um, stimulation at low frequency, you have both enzymes activated, right, during the whole time. So in red, this is the chemkinase 2, in blue, the calcineurin 2 b If you have a short, intense stimulation, initially calcineurin wins. Remember, calcineurin high <coughs> for, cal for calmodulin, it wins over calcaneus 2 but eventually calcaneus 2 wins because of uh, uh, the amount uh, present in the spine, right? So you have this kind of, of, of curve uh, when you increase the frequency. Now something very important, I'm sure you're all aware of that because you're biochemist, you're not molecular biologist, <laughs> so you know that looking at the peak is useless if you consider an enzyme. Because an enzyme that is really, really strongly uh, uh, active, but during a tiny amount of time, won't have time to uh, do its job as a, an enzyme. So what you need to look at uh, is the area under the curve, right? Uh, and uh, so that's what we do. So uh, in red here, you have the campanus 2 in blue, the, the, the PP2B, the calcineurin. And then you can say, OK, a phosphatase is actually a negative kinase. Uh, and, and you get this kind of curve. So that's a very famous curve. It's the BCM curve in, uh, in synaptic plasticity. It shows the, the, the bidirectional plasticity, right? Initially, you don't have any signal, so everything is zero. And then as you uh, increase the frequency of uh, stimulation, first you will activate calcineurin. So the first calcium that gets in will activate calcineurin. More and more calcineurin, phosphatase, you know, you got negative kinase. And then at some point, calcaneus 2 kicks in, and you go back up. And here, this frequency is called theta n. This is a frequency at which you go from depression to potentiation. But we don't, don't uh, want that. We want to look at the biochemistry. So you can transform that in a biochemical correlate, which is a ratio of activated uh, calcaneus 2 uh, calcineurin over calcaneus 2. Okay? So this ratio is 1.5 for us in our model. And then you can use this and look at what's happening uh, when you change the stimulation of, the, of the, the neurons. So first of all, if you increase the number of spikes, you don't need such a high frequency to change from depression to uh, potentiation, right? So 180 spikes at 3 Hertz have the same effect as 10, 10 spikes at 70 uh, Hertz. Uh, if you change the size of the spike as well, 
So 12 micromolar spikes at 0.3 Hertz has the same effect than uh, uh, 0.3 uh, micromolar spikes at 20 Hertz. So this is important because actually when you look at the neurons, some neurons have higher calcium spikes than others. And that will affect, therefore, the way they, are, they respond to train of stimulation. And then you can do in silico uh, mutation, and that allows us to understand lots of things that we see in experiment. Um, so in red here is my Y type. If you increase the inhibition on PP1, remember the negative feedback loop? Um, you actually uh, uh, um, favor uh, chemicalness to uh, effect. If you mutate my, uh, this training 286, the, the phosphorylation site that kept, keeps uh, chemicalness to open, right? You never reach this ratio of 1.5. And that explains why, when you look at the mutants, you never have any plasticity. So when you mutate this phosphorylation, you don't have any plasticity, despite the fact that ChemKNS2 is uh, perfectly able to, uh, to uh, catalyze uh, the phosphorylation of its targets, right? It's, it's a fine enzyme, but uh, you, you can't stabilize it uh, enough. Um, and one thing you can find is that if you change the concentration of calmodulin, <coughs> you modify this ratio. So calmodulin is actually the limiting factor in a spine. And I believe in many, many cells this is the case. Because you have so many different targets of, of calmodulin <laughs> that it's in short supply. And so calmodulin is uh, the limiting factor. And, and normally, calcineurin wins. As I said, calcineurin, high affinity for calmodulin, it always wins, right? Um, and that's actually, that explains the effect of the knockout of neurogranin. So neurogranin suck up calmodulin, and because calcineurin wins, it, it enhance, it shifts the curve toward uh, phosphatase. Uh, it's, uh, it's an unequal shift, uh, if you want. And that, that explains some puzzling uh, 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 observation by the group of Fisman, the guy who invented the calcium theory, this entire presentation, basically. And uh, there are plenty of mutants of ChemKNS2, and they found very, very weird effect of the mutation of the 3-onin-386. So 386 is the phosphorylation that blocked the binding to calmodulin, right? And they observed, when they did that, they observed a change of activity of calcineurin. So they came up with a very complicated allosteric uh, uh, theory that will have interaction between chemkinase 2 and calcineurin. And you don't need any of that. Because you have a, a, a mutation of this uh, phosphorylation site, you release calmodulin because uh, uh, well, you suck up calmodulin when in the mutant, and you release it in the in the wild wild type. And because you release calmodulin or suck up calmodulin, you modulate the activity of calcineurin. Yeah, it's just a titration effect, really. So the end of the second part, almost uh, finished. Uh, so we have an allosteric stabilization that triggers a bistable calmodulin response. Above a certain frequency, calmodulin activation lasts longer than the initial calcium signal. Okay. Calcium signal acti activates both calcineurin and chemkinase 2 at all frequency. This is a ratio of activity that changes, right? Theta m, this frequency that decides between depression and potentiation, is actually not an intrinsic property of the synapse. It, it, it's a dynamical property that depends on the on the uh, previous signal, the duration, the, the amplitude of the stimulation. Uh, so, so you have plenty of paper recording uh, the the theta m. Uh, for, for one synapse, but it, it's kind of meaningless. And, and everything is affected by the, the, the structure of the reaction, the parameters, and the initial conditions. So at the end, calmodulin decides the balance between cal calcineurin and calcineurin two is the, the, the main actor. So I will finish by showing just an image. I won't present anything uh, about uh, that, that project. But you can then use this biochemical model and put it back in a wall cell model and couple it to electrophysiological uh, modeling. So this is not the kind of modeling we, we, we can do in, in Copasi, but that's a model of an entire neuron, right? Um, so each, each part here is a, is a compartment. You have 1,500 spines, 5,000 compartments, 16,000 channels. And we model the entire neuron using uh, something called the cable theory. So each part of a neuron is modeled with a small electrical circuit. That's my uh, synapse, the head of the spine, the neck of the spine, and that's the axis, the, the right, right? 
And in each of those points, you have a biochemical model, basically what I presented so far. And you can run that on a cluster. So we use a software called Neuron uh, to model electrophysiology. Uh, the biochemistry is modeled with ECL3. We used Copasi as well, but ECL3 uh, uh, allows us to directly uh, control the variable during the simulation with the <coughs> interface. So, and, and, and then you can couple both models, and we use, of course, calcium, because we're obsessed by calcium. Uh, so here I have my biochemical calcium that triggers phosphorylation of my AMPA receptor, my glutamate receptor. That is the way of the synapse, so that affects the way of the synapse. And in the synapse, I have calcium uh, uh, um, channels. So calcium channels can open upon depolarization and increase the calcium. And this calcium is fed back to the biochemical model. And you can go round and round. That's the end of the presentation. I would like to uh, first thank the, the people who did the work. Uh, Melanie Stefan started the, the CalModeling model a uh, uh, long time ago as a PhD student in my group. She's now a lecturer in, uh, in Bar. Uh, and now recently made famous because she wrote a blog post in Nature called The City of Failures. And a few years afterward, it became very famous. It exploded on social network over the last two weeks. Uh, Lou uh, did all the kinetic modeling. She uh, was a PhD in my group, then went away for a postdoc. Is back now. Uh, uh, in my group working on uh, Alzheimer's disease. Denis uh, was a summer student with the first semi-concerted model that was then extended, polished, and much improved by Massimo Lai, who was just hired by GSK as a modeler. Uh, Michele Maccioni did the whole neuron model, and he's now working uh, in London uh, doing genomics uh, in a private company. And Stuart Edelstein is a visiting uh, poster in my group. He's one of the father of allosteri. He developed the first uh, model of uh, uh, allosteri uh, for hemoglobin in the, in the 70s. Uh, and of course, nothing of that could be done with on the software, open source software developed by the, the um, community. And of course, first and most, Kopasi. Thank you very much. <laughs> but you, said, you said you might have a very low number of L-modulin particles in the system, right? I said that I had three. Yeah. So would it be interesting to look at that system stochastically? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we did. <laughs> and uh, I didn't say there was a low number. I said there was a limiting number. I said the concept of cal is, is limiting. You have wrong. So for the spine we, we modeled, we had 18,000 molecules of calmodulin in the spine, which interestingly is close to the L number, right? L was 20,000, so it means that in our model we have always one calmodulin active. So we did, and, and, and we couldn't find any difference uh, significant on the output. So that's my calcium spike, but uh, I could have put any other uh, curve that, that didn't change much. Um, so because of the problem of stochastic simulation, it's great. We do lots of stochastic simulation, but to parameterize the model and so on and so forth, it was a bummer. So uh, we, we just went on for deterministic. But this is very different when we study the, the, the post uh, density, the place where you have receptor. There, yes, we have between 30 and 50 receptors. So stochasticity is absolutely uh, crucial. Maybe with respect to um, methodology, um, have you ever considered like feeding your experimentally determined calcium series into the carbon delete model directly without modeling the calcium spikes, but I mean, like, just feeding the experimental data in something that you did quite a um, few years ago? <laughs> we could, but the problem is so actually, this is how we started to do uh, this, this part. The problem is that our, our, our calcium spike is shaped by all the biochemical reaction. And, uh, and the, 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 for instance, when calmodulin shifts from neurogranin to, uh, to uh, camcanase 2 and, and, and calcineurin, it will, well, or 
we, we, we thought it would affect the calcium spike. We were very surprised when we saw that neuroglanin uh, mutation didn't change significantly the spike. And I have to say I'm uncomfortable with this part of the model because in literature we have actually an effect of neuroglanin mutation on the free calcium. So the spikes, I, I believe, are shaped by the biochemical reaction of the model. So if we, if we feed in an experimental spike rather than an opening channel, we will constrain the model, I think, a bit of artificially. Paper was first. Oh, so much. All right. Um, you mentioned that your your model is very applicable to depression. Um, have you got any other plans in the future to apply it to any other conditions? For example, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I, when I said depression, I was talking about the synaptic depression, oh. the small, the, the size of the synapse that 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 got smaller. Uh, that's what we call. Long-term depression or long-term potentiation, not 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 depression as a, as a physiological condition. So yeah, but the okay. confusion. Um, um, it still it, it it seems like your system is quite applicable to conditions like that because hopefully um, <laughs> things like post-traumatic stress disorder, this system becomes dysregulated. So I was wondering if you've got any plans to apply it to clinical conditions in the future. Um, well, we currently apply it to Alzheimer's disease. So we have a model where we have this as, as the model of the synapse. Actually, it's a, it's a different model, but the main principles are, are there. It's simpler on the calcium side and more complex on the phosphorylation uh, cascade. And uh, where we study the effect of the amyloid beta um, polymerization on the, on the postsynaptic uh, signaling. Uh, yes, we, uh, so that, that because we're interested in Alzheimer's disease, but other people are using very similar models uh, in other, uh, to study other affection, neurological disease, that's for, for sure. You had a question? I have a question which is totally different. It's about methodology, since uh, we, we want the focus to be on the science, but we also a little bit of methodology. So you said you, in the last part, you used um, ECL3, and I didn't catch very well what, what the reason was. You said something about controlling variables. So the question basically is, uh, what can we do in Copasi to make you use it even more? Uh, well, for this project, you can, in general, so the first thing, and uh, that won't be a surprise for Sven, because it's an event in stochastic simulation. That's all very first need. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've needed that for years and years and years, and that's one of the main reasons why uh, we are not using Copasi for everything because as soon as we have stochastic simulation, we can't use events and we use events all the time or calcium spikes are. It's about to change. Yeah. Yes. That's about to change. So, that's so that's the first thing. So for, for, the, for the Python thing is that, so for Copasi, this is dynamic coupling. So as, when, when we have input, so we study different algorithms to do that, but basically the principle is the same. Either it's fixed input or you compute the, the, the when you detect when you have events. Uh, and for Copasi, we, we, we did, we tested Copasi, PySys, and, uh, and SL3. Uh, you have to stop, you, you run the simulation, you have to stop, you change the, the files, you have to run, to stop, to run. Uh, while with ESL3, you can interact with the variables while ESL3 is running. So this loop here, we can do it without stopping ESL3. Basically, we, we tell the, the calcium concentration changed. And, and that's it. It, 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 it goes on working. Uh, but I think that depends a lot of the internal structure of ESL3 that was from the very beginning a uh, software where you had independent processes. So. Uh, Okay. In your model of how a neurogranin uh, releases the tense state of the camomile, because I, I guess this neurogranin is in a smaller amount than camomile to, to have available uh, camomile in yeah. the L state to be responsive to calcium. Well, the idea is that you have a balance, right? You have camomile that can bind or unbind from neurogranin. In very, very low concentration of calcium, you have a high affinity for neurogranin, so more calmodulin binds to neurogranin. When you put calcium, you will stabilize the state of, of calmodulin in the oral state, so the affinity for neurogranin decreases, so you would have a shift 
of, of Kalmudin population. It's a... Uh, and the other question is, is if, if you can apply this model of Katsukar modeling in other type of cells when you, you know the mitochondria has a very uh, important role in releasing the calcium or sequestering the calcium, the cytoplasmic calcium. That's, actually that's a, a far-reaching question. We could use this model everywhere. But the model, what I presented here was really, in particular, the first part to understand the mechanism of, of the biochemical mechanism of uh, calmodin activation. And uh, you know, as you know, you have two two, two useful models. One is to use model to study uh, uh, biological function, or so on and so forth. So you just want to model something, but but you're not interested in the mechanism really and or the other is to study the mechanism so if I was to model a signaling pathway we do that a lot and I needed activation of calmodulin I would certainly not use this model where you have actually 900 reactions more than 900 reactions uh, to, to model just one protein yeah. I will use the output of this model and build a, a hill function <laughs> with a k and, and an exponent that are just fitted on this model um, so I, I think I think this model is is very useful to understand calmodulin. It was new at the the time. It was uh, basically challenging the, the existing model for for calmodulin function. But I would not advise its use if if you want to model a large signaling pathway or or, or activation of calmodulin in, in a larger context. So, give the time. Last question. Yeah. So if I you correctly, all your input spikes look the same, right? In a given uh, setting, yes. So, so when you increase the amplitude, do you just scale them up linearly? No, we, we don't. We don't model uh, as as I said. We don't we don't model the spikes. What we do is we open calcium channels. Okay. So what we change is we, we change the conductance of uh, of calcium ch channels. And the, the, so there are, there are square opening of calcium channels. Uh, as, as you can measure electrophysiology, if you look at the, the, the calcium channels, you have by patch clamp, you have square signal. So we do that, and the spikes are just oriented because calcium gets in and then gets uh, removed by uh, by pumps. Okay, so thank you very much, and I'll hand over to Brian.